and um, however you are. Today's going to be a phenomenal event. Uh, we have with us Dr. Matt Bates and his extremely amazing book, Why the Gospel? Living the Good News of King Jesus with Purpose. Um, lots of phenomenal stuff in there. The do good doctor is waiting. Let's jump straight in and get this cracking. Here we go. And we're back. And with us as well is, let me change that shot because I don't like it. There you go. The very good Dr. Matthew Bates. How are you, Dr. Bates? Thank you, Gregory. Hey, I'm great. It is a absolute total honor to have you here with us again for the second time now. Hold on one quick second. Let me change something on my screen so I can see you and look at you. There you go. Yeah. Um, so for the second time with us now, um, it's really, really, really an honor. Um, we're here to talk about your phenomenal new book. And candidly, this is your day. So um, we could talk about whatever you'd like to talk about. Um, I, I think one of the things that would probably be interesting for the audience to hear, because a lot of this audience is students. Um, whether they watch it now or they watch it on the replay later. Um, a lot of them are students. A lot of them are aspiring, you know, to become PhDs, et cetera, et cetera. Probably many uh, will write books um, uh, like yourself one day. Um, tell us a little bit about a day in the life, like a day like today, uh, which has got to be very hectic, got to be tiring. I recently um, uh, saw or heard um, Dr. Carmen Imes, who's also launching a book in a couple of weeks, um, just talk about how draining it is. Tell us a little bit about you know what a day in the life looks like now that the book is done. You know, it's out in the market. People are talking about it. Um, how does that work? What are you doing today? Well, great, um, great, and it's great to be back with you. I had such a, a nice time with you uh, uh, when I was on previously. So I love your show, love your approach. Um, so yeah, day in my life, uh, it, it really varies. Um, as uh, Erdman's, uh, the publisher of this book, launched the book at probably the most awkward possible time uh, for an academic. And they launched the book, um, actually, I think it was the semester ended for me on a Friday and the book launched on a Tuesday. Um, so just after the end of the semester, maybe the only more awkward time would have been a week earlier. And that's because so much of the work for a launch is done beforehand as you know, you're preparing, um, uh, in conversation with other people, like setting up interviews, like, um, like people helping to partner and launching the book, communicating with them, graphics being designed from the, by the press and all these things going on, uh, in the background. So uh, once launch day arrives, um, then um, at least in today's day and age, there's a lot of podcast invitations. Usually, uh, if the if the book is doing well, at least uh, you'll have a fair number of those. And so I um, today, in particular, I, I'm doing three podcast interviews. Uh, they'll uh, appear at various times, I'm sure, at, at various uh, you know um, stations or whatever it might be. But uh, it's a yeah, it's a it's a hectic time, but now that summer has hit and I'm done with some of the, my more formal responsibilities, it's pretty manageable. Right after my launch, I actually um, was doing a um, the, the actual official launch date with Erdman's. Right after that, I had a speaking engagement in Atlanta where I was doing some book, book launch activities there. So that was a crazy week trying to you know coordinate all the initial launch things and then preparing for a speaking engagement in Atlanta, traveling out there and then coming back. But today um, I'll, I'll do these three or four uh, uh, podcast shows and then I've got some um, correspondence I need to catch up with on email. Uh, and uh, I actually have my son's getting ready for college. Uh, so I have a meeting with an admissions officer about uh, my son's college uh, stuff to take care of. And then I'll get some family time. Um, so uh, I'm not so hectic that I don't uh, get to have some decent family time. Awesome. Awesome. That's insightful to just hear 
um, all of the stuff that goes into it. Like personally myself, um, I am literally working on a book right now about tech and uh, and kind of tech and AI and the gospel. Um, I shouldn't say in the gospel and biblical studies. Let me put it that way. And um, you, you're, you're not aware of like even me as, I, as I'm in the process of writing, you're not aware of how much other stuff goes into it until I guess you put your your foot down to the to the the, the the grindstone and you start realizing holy cow this is it's it's it, it can definitely be overwhelming let's get to the book let's get to the book so I think it's no secret um my favorite book of yours is gospel and I'm probably going to say the name wrong gospel allegiance mm -hmm. I literally carry it in my my backpack with me I've probably read it 10 or 15 times I've made oh other people read it um Thank it's, you. it just aligns so well I, and you know last time we touched on this as well there seems to be an undertone in your work around the, the the gospel so this one again you know gospel centric um how does this tie in to your previous books or does this tie yeah. in? Yeah. Are, are you getting the idea that I care about the gospel? <laughs> yeah. That's that definitely it might, coming that, across. <laughs> that it might be really important to me and I, I think to the church and to the future of the world. Um, yeah. So I can't, I can't seem to leave this topic alone, partly because it's a burning in the bones sort of um, urgency, I think, for um, the church that we continue to preach the gospel, that we do so well with integrity and, and in ways that will be most effective in our current environment. So my previous work, as, as you mentioned, has um, it sort of unfolded as um, like I began actually my work on um, salvation specifically and on the, the gospel um, way back when I was doing PhD work, but I was really working on Paul's use of the Old Testament. So it was kind of in the background. Um, it actually informs Paul's use of the Old Testament. The gospel does in some interesting ways. So it, it made me do really careful work on the gospel. But then I wrote a book called Salvation by Allegiance Alone. And that was really a wide ranging kind of theology of salvation. Uh, and one of the things I did in that book is I asserted a gospel. I spent a little bit of time unpacking that, um, showing how Jesus had preached this and, and put this forward as the gospel um, and gave some of the biblical underpinnings to it. But it wasn't like a real thorough treatment of the gospel. I had larger um, frameworks I was, I was kind of um, trying to engage in that book. Uh, and so then um, I actually was asked by the uh, the press to uh, write a second book that would be more popular and um, a little less technical, but maybe to dive more deeply into some select topics. And so on the one hand, to, to make it uh, more approachable, but to get greater depth by just going in deeper, just into a few of the topics that I had done in Salvation by Allegiance alone. And that's the book Gospel Allegiance. And so it, the, the first half of Gospel Allegiance, I really am dealing with the question, what is the gospel and what is saving faith? And then in the second half of that book, I'm saying, OK, if this is true, if this is what gospel, the gospel is and this is what saving faith is, what does grace mean? Um, how does faith relate to that in even greater detail? What is works? Uh, what, are, what are works of the law? How does that compare with works is what Paul uh, uses as a general category, kind of dealing with all of that stuff. And then I had another opportunity to write a book on the gospel, and that's the gospel precisely. That's one that you could just give to anybody. Like it's, I, I've had junior high students read it, um, successfully read it too. I mean, it's really basic. It, it tries not to, to, to dumb things down but also uh, really does give the very essentials in sim as simple language as I could. Um, and then, um, and so that's sort of my prior work um, on, the on the gospel. This book then is quite different from those because it's really approaching the problem from a different angle entirely. And that's because even though I'd done all this work on the gospel, I sensed that maybe it wasn't accomplishing for the church what I hoped it would accomplish. Um, and that's that the church most urgently needs a gospel reframe. It really needs to to not just think about like the answer the question what like what is the gospel maybe the, maybe a pastor or a, a person in the church can answer that question well but they don't get how it fits into God's larger story enough and I begin to sense that's maybe the deeper problem like that there's this lack of ability to integrate the gospel successfully into God's larger story or m mistakes or misunderstandings about how it fits in. And that that's really the urgency. I need to address that problem and hence why the gospel. So you, 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 you have a lot, you gave us a lot to unpack there. Um, one of the questions you mentioned 
the Old Testament. And I want to come to discipleship. I feel if there's a theme of discipleship in here, you, in addition to the importance of the gospel, you seem to be pointing, in my opinion, pretty overtly um, to the, the idea of discipleship and why it's important. Before we get into that, because that's a personal pet project of mine, before we get into that, you mentioned Paul's usage of the Old Testament informs his gospel and you know his 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 writing. D explain that a little bit more. <clears throat> sure. Obviously, I know Paul touches the Old Testament significantly. It's the scripture he had. Yeah. Um, how does it inform his gospel? Because I I think that is one of the many things that's hidden. Um, I've said, uh, again, about your, like I've literally referred to your work with saying this, if we could get rid of the word faith um, out of the Christian vocabulary, I think we would do ourselves a huge favor. Um, only, not that, you know, not being sacrilegious, but I think the word allegiance describes better what is expected there. And I, I, I how does all of this tie into Paul's usage of the Old Testament. Explain yeah. that a bit more for us. So, yeah, my project when I was working on Paul's use of the Old Testament, this was my PhD dissertation, um, and it was published um, with a dreadful title, The Hermeneutics of the Apostolic Proclamation. No one can ever remember the title. Um, anyway, but in this book, I'm, I'm like, my main task was to describe not not just how Paul interprets any one text. Like, so when Paul is referring to Deuteronomy or Isaiah, and and he and he cites Deuteronomy or Isaiah, my question wasn't like, what is the mechanics of Paul as he's doing that? It was more the question of, does Paul have an overarching theory of interpretation? That 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 word for an overarching theory of interpretation or practice is called hermeneutic. So, uh, well, the question was, what's Paul's hermeneutic? Right. And so that's what, what I was sort of trying to deal with. One of the things I noticed as I was working on that is that Paul, in a couple uh, places where he seems to be revealing his his theory of scriptural interpretation, he does so in conjunction with a statement about the gospel. So, for instance, in Romans 1, 2 through 4, Paul begins in Romans by identifying himself as a servant, an apostle. right? But then he begins to uh, speak about how he, um, this is for the gospel of God, and then he describes it, the gospel which God promised in advance is the language he used through the prophets. Uh, in the Holy Scriptures. Uh, and and so as he describes it this way, we see the gospel is actually something that was pre-promised or promised in advance. And some of the significance of that is that God didn't just like announce something that would come in the future um, and not commit himself, but he committed himself. Like God actually committed himself through promises. So um, anyway, I, there's statements like that that bind um, Paul's use of the Old Testament to the gospel. We would see something similar in uh, Paul's most famous statement about the gospel, 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 5, where he says that, you know, that the Christ died for our sins. What does he say next? In accordance with the scriptures. And then eventually, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. That's a reference to the Old Testament, right? And so Paul's saying somehow Jesus's death and resurrection is, is something that, that corresponds to an Old Testament pattern and to Old Testament prophecies through patterning. Um, and so anyway, all of that is bound up with Paul's gospel, ultimately. Um, there's also larger frameworks. I think maybe this is what you were hinting at, though. Um, and that would maybe have to do with the idea of like covenant loyalty in the Old Testament, yeah. that God, yeah. God is faithful to his promises. And as he is faithful, he enters into covenants with his people. And what does it mean then to be in a right relationship with God within a covenant? It means to, to have covenant loyalty or covenant faithfulness as humans back toward God. So there's continuity between what Paul and the New Testament authors would demand for us for salvation, uh, saying that we need to um, we need to give a, 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 our fealty to God or we need to express our faith or our loyalty toward King Jesus and what we find in the Old Testament about covenant loyalty with regard to the people of God and Yahweh. Very, 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 very interesting. Yeah, that's uh, one of the places where it it, it kind of came to life for me the most, that it wasn't simply about, you know, belief, about a mental, you know, a, a acuity. It was really more about, you know, it had to be about something deeper than that and allegiance um, um, uh, one other scholar used to refer to it as believing loyalty. Um, you know, it, it, it just resonated with me really well. And I found that very clearly in your work. So thank you for that. Yeah, um, I think you must be Michael Heiser's view. You have in view there. Precisely, right? the believing yes. loyalty. And uh, some others who have used that language, Michael Gorman, who uses language of trusting loyalty or believing loyalty, 
uh, a New Testament scholar, Michael Gordon Gorman, who does great work too. And so, the, yeah. the theme, everyone used, well, not everyone, some, different people use different terms for it, but the theme, as I started recognizing it, it reappears a lot more places. Um, 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 Scott McKnight, um, his, it, it's very clear, very, in my opinion, very prevalent in what he's writing. Even N.T. Wright, who some would say is extremely conservative and you know, kind of very old school, so to speak, um, in some ways at least. Um, it, I think it's very prevalent in his work that it's it's more than just about you know the way we here in the Western Hemisphere, especially. I I I, I can speak about the Western Hemisphere because I live here, um, so I, I I'm not making an assumption about other hemispheres, but in the Western Hemisphere for sure, um, we've a, a, a assimilated or correlated faith with belief. And if you believe mm -hmm. something, you know, have at it's all it's all good. But I've often struggled with that as a young Christian, um, and it, it 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 you know even as I've matured in my Christianity, I, I I always felt like there's got to be more than just me believing, and and you see that recur in James as well. Mm -hmm. So um you know uh, that that's that, that your work really helped clarify that for me. So. One of the other themes in here, by the way, I uh, see a live viewer there. Hey, what's up, um, sister? Um, you're getting a free book. It's going to be shipped to your house by FedEx. You'll have it tomorrow. Um, anyone else that joins questions or whatever, you're getting books as well. Um, back to the question. How does this tie into discipleship? Like I said, I feel like you're in this book, especially you seem to be pointing to the need or the urgency for discipleship and you I, I i'm i'm not trying to put words in your mouth but i'm going to suggest that maybe that's what you were inferring when you said you expected the previous work to have a different impact on the church or different reaction out of the church um and therefore you know that that kind of helped drive this how does discipleship tie into this and what would you want to see as a result of, um, you know, you, this specific book, why the gospel? Yeah, that's, um, I mean, such a huge question because you're right. That thread is just throughout the book. It makes it hard for me to answer it concisely um, as I would see discipleship as the path of salvation, quite frankly. And so um, whenever we are saved, it's because we have responded to King Jesus in such a way that we have declared our loyalty to him which means that we are going to come to him as disciples and we're going to begin to learn from him. So um, one way, I mean, I think there was many ways I could get it. We could, we could speak about this theme in the book. And one way to get a handle on it uh, would be certainly my, in my fifth chapter, which um, really focuses on transformational viewing. Um, and I, I really speak about the earliest disciples and, and their process of encountering Jesus and uh, really seeing as thematic and programmatic Jesus's um, uh, invitation to them, come and see. Right. Um, and that they're invited. We see this in the Gospel of John that as the disciples are interested in pursuing Jesus, come and see. Right. And I think both of them are necessary. We both need to approach Jesus with an intention toward discipleship. We need to come to him. Right. But that's not enough. There has to be an intentional seeing. Um, and the intentional seeing is actually important for us as disciples and important for our transformation. And there's a lot of things that can prevent us from seeing Jesus. Um, we can be prevented just because the world um, puts Jesus under many layers and many disguises, he, many costumes, right? Uh, that Jesus gets thrust into this, you know, this agenda, the gun rights Jesus or the LGBTQ Jesus or whatever you might have, both on the left and the right, right? The, Jesus is like disguised. So we have to like come and see in scripture again and again and again, or else we'll just discover the Jesus that culture puts forward rather than the true Jesus. And then it's not just culture. The problem is also our own hearts, right? That we have our, our, our certain kind of selfish inclinations and our, our certain habitual patterns of thought. And what we would like to discover more than anything else, what would just make Gregory happy and Matthew Bates happy is if we were to discover that we've been right all along about pretty much everything, uh, mm -hmm. that, it, that, um, that we really have this deep confirmation bias. Like I want to discover that the various social agendas that I've followed, that I've supported, the various, uh, you know, um, figures I cheer for, uh, my, my own heroes, right? I want to discover that they really are heroes, that they really do have the right agenda, that I have the right agenda. And I'm going to find that in the Bible if I'm not careful. I'm just going to find whatever I, I want to find in there because I really want to desperately get affirmation that uh, we want that emotional affirmation uh, more than anything else. Like our, we want emotionally to be, to, to discover that, that we've been right all along. 
And so that's a real danger for us. We have to come and see. We have to, we have to let Jesus disrupt all that. And if we don't, then we're not going to be disciples. So this involves like the path of discipleship involves being a learner, um, like, like looking at Jesus. And I think the Sermon on the Mount is probably the premier place to begin, right? There's lots of places we could begin, but we learn a lot about what it means for Jesus to be our king, right? He's there proclaiming the kingdom of God. Uh, he's teaching his disciples intentionally what it means to be under his banner uh, in that in the Sermon on the Mount. And we have a lot to learn about Jesus's ways. Sermon on the Mount is a great place to start. I love it. I, I'm going to refer to a chapter in your book. You just touched on chapter five. One a chapter that struck me as very interesting was gospeling backward with purpose. Talk to me about gospeling backward. What are you trying to get at there? I, I, I think it's important. So I'm giving you the opportunity to delve a little Thank bit you. deeper into gospeling backwards. Yeah, that, there's there's really two ways in which we gospel backward. And um, the whole book is, I, I hope, a, a very practical book. Um, on the one hand, sometimes the practical stuff is like learning through teaching how to reframe. Like it's some, some of that is a practical reframing through teaching. But others is more a practical analysis of what's gone wrong in the church. I have a chapter on the nuns and the duns and why they're leaving. But in that last chapter, um, the one you mentioned, gospeling backward with purpose, I'm especially trying to equip um, Christians to evangelize. Um, as I want to share the good news with people, I want to do it well. Um, I, I want to take what I've learned and uh, and also what I've learned through reflection on scripture and um, use that as a way of helping us as a church collectively to be um, better at inviting people uh, to uh, give their loyalty to this King Jesus. So um, gospeling backwards with purpose really has two intentions. One intention is that we need to reverse the common pattern uh, by which we gospel. And I can explain what I mean by that more if you wish in just a second. The second would be that we need to gospel backward by leading forth with something we don't usually lead forth with. Um, and that is with truth, beauty, and goodness. And that we need to lead forth with that rather than some other things we, we usually lead with. So um, yeah, if you want me to unpack either of those more, I can do that for you. I like the lead forth with truth, beauty, and goodness. Unpack that a bit more for us. Why? And, and I know it's a bit of a rhetorical question, but why is that so important? Um, you know, versus leading forward with, you know, the things that we would more typically lead forward with. Unpack yeah. that, please. Yeah, so we might typically lead forth with the idea that, um, okay, you're a sinner and you're going to hell so that you need to be rescued from your plight so that you can go to heaven. Um, or we might lead forth with the idea of like, don't you know that God loves you and he's really righteous and that you're actually not righteous. And so you've got to have that, you got to have that taken care of because you have this debt or this guilt problem, right? That, that, that needs to be erased. Um, and so I think that that's not the wisest place for a number of reasons. I think in our current cultural environment, there are many people who are skeptical about the idea that God will bring judgment. Um, that, that, that it's just not very helpful to say like, Hey, you're a sinner and God's going to judge you. So you better get with the program. I think, um, a lot of people, um, even though that's true, I think God is going to judge. I don't think a lot of people are on board with that message and they don't necessarily trust what the Bible says. So it might have been 50 years ago where there was a lot of respect for the Bible and culture. You could have been like, mm -hmm. well, don't you know that you're um, you're not righteous, that you're a sinner and that you need salvation? Let, let me show you in the Bible where it says, you know, all humans sin, you know, and then like, don't you know you're a sinner? And you know, the person's like, okay, yeah, I guess the Bible says it, so I must believe it. People just aren't there anymore. Um, and so I think a, a helpful strategy is to think about um, something that we all experience um, and that is something that is part of the goodness of creation um, and that points to God in very clear ways and to help people see that like that they that there's something tarnished or damaged with that goodness and that that might be something that's a spur to them to help them begin to think about what would restoration look like. Um, and if God loves us and loves creation, what would it mean for God to restore all things? And so when we begin with truth and beauty and goodness, we might we might start in a different place. Um, we might start by saying, like, do you see like the amazing splendor of this lake and, and, and the mountains around it and just how beautiful it is as we're out, you know, hanging out with a buddy as we're you know picnicking or hiking or whatever it might be? And we might through that, like notice also that like, man, it's too bad there's garbage alongside the lake. Uh, it's really too bad that people are damaging this pristine glory, right? That, um, that is uh, something that speaks so clearly of, of something transcendent. 
And as we're noticing these things, um, we know we see something tainted that's damaged, right? And that actually can can be an opportunity to say that you know that God's intention is eventually to restore all things. That like one day God's intention for His creation isn't just to melt it or to 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 burn it down to nothing, but any melting God's going to do is toward a refinement that God wants to purify and He wants to create He wants the all of creation to experience His glory and so that it can be even more marvelous than what we see now in some mysterious way and that that's God's intention not just for creation but for you. And then we can maybe think about ways in which, uh, and I think this is a good pattern for sharing, you can begin to tell stories about your own life. You can tell stories about how you, um, although like you you have hopes of being a good person and you try to be, and you're good in some areas of your life, like how you've caused damage and harm to yourself and to other people by the shameful choices you've made. And you can help people to realize that you're something good that's damaged and that God wants to restore you. Um, and by telling that story about yourself, by saying, hey, like, here's something I struggle with. I'm struggle, I struggle with pornography or I struggle with alcohol or I, I'm struggling with, um, you know, being mean spirited toward my spouse or I'm, I'm jealous about my with my coworker. Like these various problems that are bringing harm to ourselves and to our environment. Um, we can use those as an opportunity to begin to help the other person reflect about their own lives by telling stories about your life, right? Help them to reflect about their own lives. But I think if we lead forth with with um, with truth, beauty, and goodness, and think about the ways in which they, they become damaged, it helps connect better with God's restorative purposes through the gospel. Holy smoke. I literally have goosebumps. Um, gospeling backwards. I think I'm going to start using that terminology in exactly um, that manner. Very, very, very powerful stuff, Dr. Bates. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to close with the, I'm a, I'm a kind of lead, lead a little bit here. I'm going to close with the question on if you could get, if you could see one result out of the capital C church. So, you know, the local church, the, the greater church, et cetera, from your work, what would you, you know, what would be the desired, um, 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 you know, results? One, top one. But before we get into that, I got to ask. This is a tech channel. I'm a tech nerd. As someone, as a scholar that I deeply respect, I got to ask a tech question. Sure. What are your thoughts on AI as it relates to the gospel? Good, bad, AI evil. As it relates to the inherent, gospel. Like, should we avoid it? it? Should we lean into it? What are your mm. thoughts on that? That's a tough one. And I, because, uh, you know, honestly, I haven't really thought about it. And post it. So, <laughs> yeah, I haven't really thought about it much with respect to the gospel. Um, you know, I think, you know, I don't have enough expertise to speak very credibly about AI and in terms of its ultimate future or things like that. I can only really speak about what we're presently experiencing. Right. Um, and so, you know, right now I would see it as mostly a tool that it can both cause harm and do good, right? On the one hand, um, it causes harm when students use it to cheat. Uh, that's one of my realities, trying to deal with students who are using AI in inappropriate ways, you know, as the, the assignment has certain boundaries and they're transgressing those boundaries by pretending work is created purely by themselves when in fact they're using a robot to create the work or whatever it might be. And there are ways to avoid that as a professor and ways to give them more reflective assignments that force them to not use AI. And I'm, I'm pondering how to do that well. Um, yeah, and uh, you know, and in terms of harm, you know, that uh, I think can come from from uh, AI. That's a, a really obvious example. In terms of good, obviously, um, huge opportunities for uh, people to use handy tools for marketing for all kinds of purposes, right? That that aren't bad and can be can be useful. The one th one of the things I fear um, as an author is just like that that the world is already so awash in information, and mm. um, and that. AI gives the ability to create such an enormous amount of new information um, in the sense of just kind of maybe, maybe it's not even new information. Some of it will be, but, but just producing more and more stuff that will people be able to find true wisdom in the midst of that, right? I, I worry about um, that it will just become more difficult for people to find wisdom in the midst of just the flood of what AI might produce in terms of the quantity of music and video and, and, and you know, as an author, um, words, right? Um, as uh, there's gonna be just thousands and thousands and thousands of more words created by AI. So anyway, um, you're, I'm, I'm sure your thoughts on the, on the gospel and AI are t 20 times, 100 times better than mine, uh, but that's all I got for you right now. 
No, those thoughts are exactly what I, I have plenty of the and I interface with technical or, you know, technological people like myself often. So I have lots of that content. What I don't have a lot of and what I suspect my audience would be interested in is non-technical people, scholarship, you know, that that mm. I don't want to call it the ivory tower because that has a negative connotation. But, you know, your world that is not directly living in technology, tech, you know, technologist fan um, 24 seven, like I am, how, what's your take on it? So I find it very interesting that you're the second um, um, scholar professor that I've heard immediately come out the gate saying, you know, about cheating and, you know, um, um, people using it for um, other, um, you know, less honorable purposes. Mm -hmm. That's sad. Um, but, you know, I kind of expected that back in my day, we had that with calculators, you know, people would, would cheat and bring calculators yeah. into math tests and try to, you know, cheat that around. And, you know, professors have figured out ways around that. I'm certain that technology and professors will figure out ways around this. I find it interesting that you say though, um, you know, the influx of just information is, it could potentially make it more difficult to find wisdom. Um, that is very, very much the truth. Um, so one of my personal little hobby horses that I'm on right now, um, you know, we, we need to be very aware that the data, the, the, the information that comes out of most of these chat, all of these chat bots is unequivocally wrong. Like <laughs> yeah. from a factual perspective, yeah, a lot of it's it is. words strung together nicely, but yeah. it's not fact checked. So yeah. you better be doing your fact checking, otherwise yeah, you you're, for sure. you know you will absolutely end up with um, just complete utter lack of wisdom. So I, I think that's going to um, put more of a demand on authors like yourself, Dr. Carmen Imes, and et cetera, et cetera, that actually write good stuff and actually you know a robot didn't generate it. This is your years of study and your expertise that's on paper in a way that's digestible for lay people like myself. Um, I, I suspect it's going to cause, and that's probably why you're as busy as you are today. Um, there's an appetite out there for, you know, I, I need actual content, not, you know, Joe Blow on the street that, you know, asked chat GPT 15 questions and now has a 150 page book. I mm -hmm. need an expert to really explain this to me. I'm seeing this in my, um, like my men's Bible study groups. I'm seeing it there as well. There's a hunger like in the church. So we're segueing into my last question. There's a hunger in the church for, we need meat. You know, as Paul said to the Corinthians, I I, I don't want to stay on, um, you know, fluff. I, I need content. I need mm. to really understand the richness of what the gospel is. And as you say, who King Jesus is, you know, his, he's the king. Like we need to really get our cells wrapped around that. So on that note, my final closing question, let me take a quick second. Yeah, too much of a good thing can be a bad thing. I was making sure there were no questions in the chat. Um, just some comments and people asserting what you've said. If you could see one output, result of your work in the church, what would you like it to be? Allegiant churches. That's it. That's easy for me to answer because I, I really, that's my heart and the heartbeat of all this work is that um, the gospel is about King Jesus, that it's about how Jesus is in the process of restoring all things. But the way in which we we interface with King Jesus is that we need to become his loyal citizen body. We need, whenever we gather as a group of people in Jesus's name, we need to not just sing songs that say, I love you, or um, maybe are more about us finding our identity in Jesus or whatever it might be. We need to celebrate God, of course, in those appropriate ways. But the, the most urgent thing when we gather is to come under Jesus's authority. Uh, to collectively say, you are my king right now, and I want to, I want you to rule over me right now in the midst of this people, because this is the citizen body of the king. I want to hear you. I want you to make authoritative decisions, and so that we are listening to you and ready to heed your directives and go out into the world. So Allegiant Churches is, um, and, I, and I mean this on the local level, um, meaning each local body being Allegiant, but also as that can move forward into denominations that, um, that say what our denomination is mostly about is about loyalty to King Jesus, 
I would love to see denomination, uh, denominational faces change uh, in that sense, or denominational confessions um, to reflect a King Jesus and loyalty approach. So the building of allegiant churches, I think, is necessary for our own sake, um, as that's the, that's where we're restored. That's where we find our full humanity. But it also needs to be the resource for our mission for the world. Like as we go out and we proclaim Jesus the King, like the local citizen body is where we 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 practice our alternative social politics. It's where we say no, the right and the left don't have a corner on the market mm -hmm. ar around what it means to be a true people. Like that. If you want to know what it means to be truly human and to be fully human, to be fully flourishing in our humanity, come into the midst of our our group that is celebrating King Jesus and is trying to heed his authority and realize that that's where real political power and real political energy moves forward into the world that can actually make a difference is as we begin to heed King Jesus. So allegiant churches, that's uh, my answer. You, you you got a little bit of preacher in you there, sir. Very, 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 <laughs> very you. inspiring stuff. Well, um, you made me think of um, um, in Joshua where the commander of the Lord's army, you know, Joshua approaches him. Are you on our side or theirs? Neither. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I am on the Lord's side. I fight mm -hmm. for the Lord. So I suggest, like you said, left nor right has any, you know, isn't the, the truth here. It's about King Jesus. Doc. Thank you very, 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 very much again for your time. Thank you for the effort and the, the sweat, blood, and tears that you probably put into this book. Um, continue putting out great work like this. Continue you know, making sure it's accessible for audiences like me and you know, the people that are out there that might not be scholars. Um, we very, very, very genuinely appreciate it, and we need it. Um, thank you, sir. Thank, Hope thank you get you some Gregory. rest. Uh, I know oh, congratulations I on, I think you had a recent um, um, anniversary, if I recall correctly. Yep. Um, yep. Congratulations. Thank Hope you. you get some really, really good family time. Hope everything with your son and his college um, pro admissions process. I'm probably about three years away from that myself, and I'm fearful of it in advance. Right. Um, I hope yours goes very, very smoothly. Thank, um, you. thank you, sir. And thank you to your audience, too. I, I thank you for those who tuned in live and those who will listen later. Awesome. Have a great day, sir. And on that note, um, we are about to say goodbye. We appreciate um, that you were here with us today, that you joined us. Um, and if you're checking it out on the replay, um, books are on the way out um, to everyone that has been listening. We have about five or 10 books to give away. So I will find places to give them away in addition to the people that were live that are getting them live. Thank you. Thanks to Dr. Matt Bates. This has been Bible Hacking. We out.